it immediately. Okay, great. So very quickly, uh, Suvranel is the director of climate environment and environment at Global Development Incubator, uh, where he focuses on driving systemic change through multi-stakeholder collaborations. In this new role, he is the chief uh, chief operating officer of Resilient Water Accelerator, a multi-stakeholder initiative focusing on unlocking climate financing in emerging markets. So prior to GDI, he worked at IFC, uh, World Bank, leading climate smart projects in Africa, Southeast Asia, and India. At IFC, he was one of the co-founders of the EcoCities platform, where he led the climate smart infrastructure development, uh, development work with Indian and Southeast Asian cities. This also uh, addresses challenges around economic opportunities and inclusion. He also co-founded the 2030 Water Resources Group at IFC and World Bank, where he led, uh, again, multi-stakeholder initiatives related to water resource management in Africa, Latin America, and India. He's also engaged with national and state governments on technology, policy, business models, and financial structures related to climate uh, adaptation and mitigation solutions in India, Southeast Asia, Latin America, Europe, and North America. Uh, he had started his career at Oracle Financial Services, where he led the fintech teams in India, Southeast Asia, and North America. And his background, he's a mechanical engineer, done a master's in public policy from Harvard University. He is also the co-chair of Thai Sustainability Group in India and the founding member of Harvard University's Climate Circle, where he advises and mentors over 40 startups working on deep tech software uh, and financing solutions related to climate change. So, Subranel, all yours, I'll hand over to you for the session. Thank you, Ashwati. Uh, pleasure to be here. And I'm very excited uh, to kind of engage with the panel uh, of very kind of very interesting kind of people uh, representing the venture world, then from the industry, and also from the world of startups. So we have a Sham Menon, who is a co-founder of the Bharat Innovation Fund. We have a Vishwal Vavsa, who is the head of ESG at Multiples. And then we have Ganesh Shankar, who is the founder and CEO of the FluxGen uh, Ventures. So we will ask them to introduce themselves and uh, just to kind of give an overview about their journey. Uh, then we will go into trends in the climate tech space, key challenges and opportunities. And finally, we'll ask them as to how they see as the future growth of the climate tech ecosystem. So this will be for uh, around, say, 35 to 40 minutes, and we will try to have at least 15 minutes per question answers. In the meantime, please feel free to uh, uh, share your questions over the chat window, and we'll try to ensure that we uh, kind of address them uh, at the end. So maybe without any ado, let's, let's start, and maybe I will start with uh, Sham. Uh, so Sham, uh, uh, would kindly kind of request you to kind of tell us a bit about yourself and kind of what drives you in this current role. Uh, you have a very interesting background, having done a PhD, then worked at the World Bank and now at the Venture Investing the World. So if you'd love to know more about your journey as the climate tech investors in India and what you're doing uh, now at Bharat Innovation Fund. Sham. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Subhanil, for the opportunity. I am a metallurgist by training, was a research engineer, was a, did two startups straight out of college. I, I did a startup in the nanomaterial space in the US in year 2000, uh, was making basically conductive electrodes, conductive ceramics, which is basically electrode materials for tubular fuel cells. But it was quite early in its time. You're talking 2000, 2001. Um, and then, uh, of course, our clients were mostly U.S. defense, and uh, we are trying to basically serve a very nascent industry, which was just beginning, which was uh, U.S. defense was looking at creating UAVs, drones back then, and they wanted to, they wanted to run it on microfuel cells, run the UAVs on microfuel cells. So we were providing the electrodes for that. So that was what the first startup was. The second startup was in combined heat and power. We were trying to do tubular solid oxide fuel cell based combined heat and power systems. Uh, so purely research materials, research roles. These were the two startups that I uh, was had co-founded back in uh, 
between 2000 and 2005, was part of Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, China Energy Group after that, worked a bunch of stuff on, on China, and then was with the World Bank's climate investment team from uh, in 2006-07, Became a VC from in London from 2000, end of 2007, in a climate fund, early stage climate fund, backed by Shell, Mitsubishi, etc., Goldman Sachs, etc. We were doing early stage deep tech investments in climate, mostly in energy storage technologies and emissions control technologies across Europe. Uh, moved briefly to Singapore in early 2010, 2011, uh, then decided I wanted to set up a climate fund in India and came back. And in 2012, teamed up with my partner, Kunal Upadhyay, who's who was running the business incubation arm at IMM Dubad called CIE. And we launched Infuse Ventures, the first seed fund for climate tech or clean tech in India called Indian Fund for Sustainable Energy. It was a small 100 crore fund. Uh, had a good, interesting journey with that. And then we launched a $100 million platform called Bharat Innovation Fund, which is uh, more on deep tech. Uh, deep tech early stage, pre-Series A, Series A investments in 2018. Now we are thinking of our follow-on vehicles, one of which will be in the climate space. Uh, looking at a slightly different sort of business model strategy within climate, but uh, within climate and also a continuation of our deep tech strategy in Bharat Innovation Fund. So we'll have two different strategies that we're taking forward. So this is the summary of the journey. Thank you. Great, Shama. I think a fantastic journey. So maybe... Uh... I can then go next to like Vishal. And Vishal, um, uh, you have kind of worked across industries, like starting from consulting to working with the Tata's, Ultratech, and now um, at a multiple. So if you could just kind of, kind of tell us a bit about yourself and kind of what drove you into uh, this journey of kind of working on sustainability across various industries. Thanks, thanks Runil. And uh, thank you uh, both CTIN as well as Climate Collective to have me here. Uh, uh, I am a chemical engineer by background, and while I did my engineering, I was very clear I would want to do a, a master's in sustainable development. I enrolled in a course. Uh, we started with a batch of four, ended up only three out of four ended up completing that course. And uh, for us, student to faculty ratio was one is to two or one is to three. We had almost 10 to 12 faculties who used to teach us. So that's that's what uh, drove me uh, in this area of uh, climate change and sustainability. Uh, I start, so in, in terms of my career, uh, the first half of my, of my career, I have done management consulting. I worked with EY as part of their climate change and sustainability services practice. And that gave me an opportunity to work on complex project, challenging project, but of course, interesting project in diverse area of sustainability and climate change. And that's why I, that's, that is a place where I got exposed to climate change uh, in terms of technology, in terms of finance, as well as early, uh, by the time I ended my career with EY, uh, corporates were started to talk on decarbonization very, very early days. Uh, second half of my career, I uh, wanted to uh, get experience of implementing uh, complex projects or diverse projects in the area of sustainability and climate. So I moved towards the corporate side and I worked with Mahindra Tata and Aditya Birla group uh, prior to this role in the same order. And I got an opportunity to work uh, with the senior leadership as part of these three groups, as well as working with different uh, multilateral organizations like IFC, World Bank, uh, the likes of WBCS, the World Economic Forum, uh, while I worked on different projects of uh, net zero as well as decarbonization. In my current role, I had ESG at Multiples. Uh, Multiples is a mid-market private equity firm. It's about 13-year-old firm uh, focusing pre predominantly into Indian market. Uh, we uh, have started looking at uh, opportunities coming through the whole ESG and sustainability space. And last month is when we uh, announced our first investment into clean mobility platform of Murugappa Group. Uh, so that's that's the whole journey for me, Suvranil, and I'll be more than happy to share my experience uh, as we go along the session. Thanks, Vishal. Uh, uh, I think thanks for kind of the participation here. And uh, last but not the least, like Ganesh, and Ganesh is the founder and CEO of Fluxgen Ventures. Uh, he has been a serial entrepreneur and has kind of started uh, the multiple initiatives. And I'm in particular quite excited to know about Ganesh's journey 
and how you kind of ended up uh, being a founder in the water sector space, uh, which is very kind of close to my heart, because we keep about uh, kind of hearing about various uh, climate tech startups focusing on energy or say on the next electric vehicle, but especially on sectors such as water, we do not find this number of entrepreneurs. So thanks Ganesh uh, for joining the forum and would love to know a bit more about your journey. Thanks, Kamil and uh, Climate Collective for having me here. So seemingly insignificant events in life sometimes have a deep impact on what you do. That's the case uh, with my exposure to climate and sustainability at large. <clears throat> uh, there was a lake protection rally during my childhood and they involved in a painting competition there and I participated in that competition and I won that. I got an environment encyclopedia when I was 11. So uh, during that time, I got an understanding of how ozone layer is getting screwed up or how greenhouse gas is making our life uh, very difficult. So that led to me practicing a very low carbon life very early on, thanks to that encyclopedia. I'm, third, I'm nearly 40, I still don't have driving license. Uh, I cycle to office. But what I thought was, uh, while you can change yourself, uh, what is that next you could do? So for me, after doing my master's in use of science, I was working in a aerospace company, General Electric, aerospace, and then I thought I should do something on climate or sustainability at large. In fact, climate was not even a word that was so popular then. I left the job, went to a village, worked with a company called Selco Solar. Uh, Dr. Hari Shande was an amazing mentor to uh, young entrepreneurs or young minds like me then. Uh, started a projects and consultant company after taking a year break. Worked on solar, water, uh, energy, uh, in various projects. Uh, Closely with Divecha Center for Climate Change at the Institute of Science in 2011 to 15. Made one first spin off in 2017 called Air Pro, uh, along with my colleagues then at uh, this one. We were flying drones on the solar assets to identify deficiencies in solar farms. We were able to uh, improve the solar efficient, uh, solar plant efficiency. These are like 100 uh, megawatt kind of uh, large scale utility scale, increasing profits to our customers by 20%. And Tata Solar, SoftBank, LG, bunch of these as our clients went across three continents. This company was acquired by a San Francisco-based company called DroneBase. Um, while building company was thing, I, I thought the next thing is building communities. And I wrote a blog that um, while all the non-sustainable guys anyway work like a mafia, where is the green mafia? And started a company called Sus Mafia. Uh, and uh, as far as like, my entrepreneurial journey goes, I realized we could solve solar intelligence, what next? I thought uh, while mitigation is important, but it's not catching up, adaptation and resilience is equally important. So that's how I started the water intelligence company while it was uh, initially a project and consulting business. So today we cater to large and very large companies like Tata, Tata Steel, Vedata Group. We have 60 plus client companies which want to de-risk themselves from water crisis, you know, whether you like it or not, water crisis is happening. So we use data-driven approach, whether it's IoT or uh, various other data to help take data-driven approach towards uh, helping industry to become water positive. So yeah, I mean, uh, that's a journey from the encyclopedia to do my bit in water tech. Thanks, Ganesh. And I think we always speak about the need for multiple stakeholders to come together to address a big challenge such as like climate change. But here we have, I think all the three kind of uh, parts of the ecosystem kind of coming together. So really, uh, makes a lot of sense. So maybe I will uh, go back to Sham and uh, maybe starting with the trends. Uh, so the investor, Sham, uh, please tell us as to what are the trends that you're seeing in the decarbonization space, both kind of globally as well as is relevant uh, for India. So maybe you can uh, talk about specific sectors or if you talk about climate, it could be around mitigation, adaptation. And if you can kindly allude to what types of funding that we are seeing that are needed to really support the climatic ecosystem in India. Thank you. See, I mean, of course, naturally, Surinil, most of it has been mitigation focused for a while, whether it is global or India, of course, the India story is still very new, you know, in terms of climate investing. But globally, I mean, the problem has been that every decade climate comes as a theme for investing. And then people try it, they don't make money and they leave. <laughs> So every decade this happens and every decade the hope is it's different this time. I mean, that's always the belief that it will be different and, and that's what keeps the, the journey going. Of course, this time around, 
things look better in terms of regulation and corporate engagement and potential customer engagement, things feel different. I have now been through three cycles of this, 2000, then 2010, and now 2020. So three cycles of the same thing I've been through. So, uh, you know, back in 2000, when we launched our startup, there was a big boom and everybody was jumping in. Then 2007, 8, the same thing, and now the same thing again. So, I mean, I just hope it's different this time. I don't know if it will be or not. I mean, let's hope. Now, adaptation's always been a stepchild in this in this paradigm you know it has to change because i think now adaptation is almost more needed or as much needed you know because you are now witnessing all the problems with climate change you've got to do something now so i have a feeling this time around you're going to see a lot more focus build on what ganeshan team are doing and others are doing which is actually on the adaptation side mitigation of course has capital now coming in you had your solar wind era You've got your mobility era, you've got your agri era, which is also stepping up. And the next step on the mitigation side is going to be the industrial decarbonization. So that is the next level, which is where cement and steel and all of the big guys, all of the other big sectors have to start decarbonizing. That's on the mitigation side. If you move and water has got a role on both fronts, it's there on mitigation and adaptation, both sides you have the role. So water is actually straddling both. Adaptation may, what I'm realizing is that the agri guys are actually well-placed, the agri tech fellows, because the climate resiliency in agri is something that agri tech can actually enable. At least the fact that you are able to get, collect data, analyze it, and give some early warning feedback to farmers to figure out what to do. We were talking to a few adaptation startups recently. They didn't, they never called themselves adaptation or climate resiliency startups. They were just startups trying to help agri farmers increase yield and one question I kept asking them is, you guys are young guys jumping into the field. Why would farmers who have been doing farming for the last 30, 40 years care to listen to what you are doing? And one, one key insight I got from three to four startups now in this space is the farmers are also getting a little lost because things are changing. They are actually not able to deal with the changes that are happening now in terms of weather patterns and all kinds of things. So they are themselves struggling that their passed down knowledge over over generations is not good enough anymore to stay on top so they need help so there is that opening is where the adaptation startups are coming in on the climate resilient agri side which may be the leader on the adaptation front of it and of course a whole bunch of data iot startups out there which are trying to utilize a whole bunch of data and give climate risk analytics for industries etc this becomes the adaptation play going forward i'm sure in india you'll have a lot of flood resiliency and drought resiliency related startups also that jump into the fray today i haven't seen too many but i'm sure they will jump in uh, on the adaptation side so there will be more guys who will play there uh, water for sure is becoming more and more and more and more critical so a lot of the solutions where you're able to reuse more and more water no matter what the application, the ability to clean up and reuse, clean up and reuse it multiple times is going to be critical. So that's also going to play for sure. Mitigation may the big, big untapped sectors in India continue to be real heavy industry. Really the carbon, I mean, the whole cement and steel and paper and pulp and all of this. Now, the problem with all of them is you have a core process and then you have ancillary. Core people are worried to let people in there if you are a steel company you don't want to mess with the blast furnace operations that is critical to a tata steel a jsw and everyone so it's very difficult for a startup to stick its head in there but if you are on the ancillary you have a shot now for example can you take the boiler which is being uh, you know heated by fossil fuels and electrify that can you do industrial waste heat recovery you know, can you do other things in the periphery? Can you increase the amount of renewables used within the industrial premise? Can you do more efficiency across that industry? All that is okay. Core process uh, interventions are still a little bit more of a no-no for industry. But uh, that in my mind, this whole industrial decarbonization story is still left to play out. You don't yet have too many startups either in India. But I do feel that that will play out over the coming uh, at least next couple of years, two, three years, we should see more startups jump in that can play that. But basic realization is software alone doesn't cut it. You need to have solutions integrated with hardware. 
climate is a not a software problem climate is a hardware problem you can't solve it with just software so you need hardware that's a basic realization you have to create full solutions which are integrated back to front you have to create full solution offerings ideally with financing because trying to get customers to think about spending for solutions using technologies they can understand is a risky proposition in india most end customers don't want to spend that kind of money so you end up having to create full integrated solutions and if possible bring financing as well to the table if you wa really want uptake this is if you ask me the sum and substance of our last 10 12 years of investing in this space is mm -hmm. don't try to solve this like a regular uh, uh, vc deal you know where you know you build a software and you scale using it you know everything immediately it doesn't happen like that in climate climate is no problem to solve so you have to have a full solution which is fully integrated that's sure. the basic summary of our journey on this thanks sham uh if i think there there was some background noise if, if others can mute that will be really good uh so maybe like a uh, vishal and i know that uh, sham kind of uh, mentioned a bit about industrial decarbonization and i would like to kind of maybe double down on that one uh, is maybe ask you is to like what are the trends that you were seeing um, in the industrial decarbonization space uh, specifically uh, on the hardware based sector such as cement and steel and maybe just to ask you that is it the kind of the growing awareness around esg or is it like government regulations that they are kind of thinking about or whether it is the sole business case that is like driving this uh, the industry sector in india thanks urvanil so uh, i would want to uh, just put my thoughts in there are uh, re definitely a shift in terms of the interest of decarbonization or let's say the climate agenda by most of the corporate india but maybe i'll try to uh, uh, give my context more from the industrial or hard to abate sectors so in terms of key trends if you see it, it i can bucket them into like four segments one is the regulatory environment because there is a drastic change in terms of the pace at which regulations are coming up from indian context globally of course you have the climate agenda driven by bodies like un and all but uh, from a indian context after the, the government of india announced the net zero commitment for 2070 you have the green hydrogen policy which has come up you have the amendment of energy conservation bill which is paving the way for the whole domestic carbon market so that that's the pace and interest of new regulations coming up uh, and influencing the whole decarbonization space for them the second one is uh, the commitments uh, indian corporates have not shied away uh, for taking commitment and uh, most of the large firms actually committed for net zero even before the country committed for net zero by 2070 so you have the likes of the early ones like the mahindra group committed for net zero by 2040 you have the hdfc bank financial services you have jsw uh, steel you have ultratech cement so all biggies actually went out and said that they would want to move towards net zero by 2050 or a lot of companies have even committed for earlier than 2050 so corporate commitments uh, and action by the corporate india uh, is there uh the third one uh, is basically uh, the new kind of technology shift which you see so corporate india as uh, sham alluded to it where most of the traditional uh, decarbonization levers like investing into renewables infrastructure all those have have happened in india for last couple of decades but corporate india have started betting on new new technology so you have the uh, there are lot of interest into green hydrogen of course everybody has read and heard about it but from a, a startup ecosystem maybe on actual investment there is not much of play but uh, startups can come into play in the value chain so it's not that the green hydrogen will be delivered by the only the biggies you will have uh, you will have startups or companies who will have to maybe do the uh, storage the distribution as well as in the value chain of electrolyzer right so you have the whole interest in green hydrogen the second one uh, second big technology which uh, companies or art to abate sectors uh, will explore going forward is the carbon capture storage and utilization here again uh, uh, 
outside india there have been good examples of startups so here you don't have large organizations coming and disrupting the space but it has been the startups who have come up with a solution of carbon capture and technology and they have taken away a good amount of uh, projects globally so similarly uh, from an indian context hard to abate sectors will have to invest into this technology because without this uh, the hard to abate sector will not be able to move towards the near net zero or the net zero context so good opportunities from a startup uh, ecosystem to look at carbon capture and technology uh, the third one is the shift in uh, energy sources so the whole energy transition space so uh, electrical uh, demand getting met through ipps or large projects like mature technology like solar hydro wind has happened right but now corporates are looking at extension to this so you have the whole uh, battery ecosystem how can batteries be integrated to have the round round the clock clock renewable source of power being made available and the second one of course what sham touched upon so uh, electricity is just one part uh, people don't focus on the other part which is a thermal energy huge amount of gag emissions happen in that segment so companies are looking at moving to an alternate source moving away from the likes of fossil fuel in form of solid fuel like coal or liquid fuel like diesel and fo to uh, moving to elect if one can electrify the whole heating demand and the source of electricity be coming from renewables is going to solve the 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 big piece of decarbonization for these companies and here again uh, one example i can give in my pr previous uh, stint with ultratech ultratech signed up with a startup uh, who was going to help them to move from fossil fuel based uh, clinkerization to electrical uh, way of clinkerization process so there are ample amount of examples uh, where hard to abate sector or indian corporates are looking at newer ways of decom approaching the whole climate space and there you will have ample am amount of opportunities for the startups to come in so all of this is more on the mitigation end uh, corporates are also looking at the adaptation or resilience so because uh, you have large assets which are operating and all of these assets are going to operate for longer term horizon right so the the whole uh, changes which are coming through the physical risk of climate change be it let's say availability of water good quality water to run your operations or the natural events like hurricanes or cyclones disrupting the operations so there you have the uh, the likes of analytical tools or uh, startups who can give a good amount of early signals for this corporate uh, entity so that they can better uh, visualize the kind of risk and then do or set up a mitigation plan to minimize those risks for them great vishal uh, i will have some kind of follow up questions for later but i will kind of go to ganesh now and ganesh you are kind of one of the active uh, members in the climate ecosystem in india so kind of kind of give us an kind of overview about the trends that you are seeing uh, from the various climate tech startups uh, that are working on india and here again maybe give us uh, some kind of overview about the ones focusing on bit on mitigation with a be adaptation or say on carbon removal nature based solutions are we still seeing more on the energy mobility side vis-a-vis -vis the other sectors and also maybe ask you that uh, like like from the various uh, discussion it seems like it's still considered like an urban problem but most of the startups they are still around like bangalore the mumbai the delhi and their area how much you you see the ecosystem also evolved in the tier two tier three cities and what are the sectors to focus on um, across the, the rural belt as well so to be honest, in last uh, uh, three, four years, my uh, focus has been more on water, but I would like to give from my larger understanding from limited interaction with people on uh, uh, climate tech at large, right? So, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I, I've seen solar to a large extent and uh, when I entered that space, we, the whole country had only 50 megawatt solar total capacity. Today, we are almost like close to 60, 60 gigawatts installed capacity and uh, I think we are uh, marching very well ahead to achieve the 500 gigawatts uh, in by 2030. Uh, I think that is something, uh, it's a path that uh, the country has chosen and we have very good companies, including uh, Solar Ladder, uh, various solar tech companies, Dexler Energy, bunch of these 
uh, companies are doing really good, which uh, I, I keep hearing that uh, uh, they're able to evolve. I think the biggest challenge I have seen in the decarbonization is a scope three emission. If you consider an Apple phone, which they want to be carbon neutral by 2030, I think uh, the whole value chain to actually decarbonize is something that is a harder problem to solve. These are something where the waste management companies are playing a circular economy. Companies are doing very good. Like uh, I, I can talk about Ujwal of, um, uh, sorry, uh, it's various, uh, I, I know a lot of uh, waste management circular economy company uh, doing a good job on that to decarbonize. Uh, and with respect to uh, alternate materials, right? I mean, if you think of it, if you if Tata Steel wants to come with green steel, right? I mean, it's just not about going for the ore and getting a new uh, steel, right? They are trying to recycle the existing steel and everything. So a lot of people who are able to recycle and come uh, give back to the furnace. I think that is uh, evolving. And I also uh, recently heard uh, a company which is going to recycle your batteries, metastable materials, uh, uh, is doing something good. I think. The whole uh, journey on decarbonization, this harder problem I feel is on the scope three emission and uh, a lot of uh, development is in that sector. If I have to talk about uh, a bit of something that I have more expertise is with water, uh, so it, it's more valuable to the audience. Uh, see, water, as uh, Sham said, uh, is both uh, uh, mitigation and, uh, as well as uh, adaption. I mean, uh, I, I recently heard from a... <laughs> Uh, iron exchange uh, executive saying that 10% of uh, emission is because of water sector. I, I was quite thrilled or rather shocked rather should be that water actually leads to that level, right? I mean, so it's kind of a Siamese instance with energy. I mean, whether it is in lifting the water, movement of water or uh, treating water, right? Whether it's a wastewater treatment, all this consumes a lot of energy. On the second aspect is mitigation resilience. Uh, of course, I mean, if I while I'm talking to you, uh, we get water all the way in Bangalore. We get water all the way from uh, 120 kilometers, right, from River Kaveri. Uh, while we had more than thousand lakes in the city of Bangalore uh, before, and we have only handful today. So, in the sense, uh, while there is a, you know, when you consider climate change as import, important, uh, fueling this uh, water crisis along with rapid urbanization, warmer planet changes uh, at a uh, um, precipitation levels and the evapotranspiration, which leads to change in the rainfall pattern. That means the cities that were built from Ashoka to Akbar don't necessarily have the same availability of water. So I think there's a lot of uh, uh, opportunity in water sector. Uh, one in, I think, the wastewater uh, side, I think there is a huge need to convert. This is the water that is usable. I mean, if uh, India is going to give give her girl every person a water tap that means the shrink there's a shortage of water for various sectors i mean like when you have jal jeevan mission actually promising water to every individual that means there is a shortage of water that uh, of water because people who are consuming a bucket or two buckets of water will now be consuming 10 to 20 buckets of water which is important it's a right to have water now that there is a shortage i think the natural Progression is about uh, becoming water positive. So how do you become water positive? There are multiple approaches. One aspect is rainwater harvesting. Ensure all that water that you get, you utilize it. The second aspect is about efficiency. Ensure that you use the least amount of water according to your thing. And that's where you have to conserve water. The third piece, of course, is how will you use the wastewater, right? I mean, are you using it back to your industry or not? So there are various uh, circular economy in water uh, I have come across and doing an incredibly good job. So all these three things together can ensure that shortage of water for industry can be managed by becoming water, which will not even be consuming the mainstream water that you and I would consume as part of our metro water connection. Right? So uh, these are some uh, aspects. And uh, I think uh, why Bangalore and Chennai is, of course, uh, there is always an ecosystem that has evolved in Bangalore. You have Sham and others seated in Bangalore and various other metros. So you know uh, there's obviously a, a huge, but today, after COVID, you can be anywhere. People don't take venture capital meetings on an in-person meeting, right? So I think today, I think Sham would take meeting people, uh, somebody coming from Hubli or somewhere Rasik to take the thing. He doesn't expect 
uh, uh, anybody to come to his office anymore. So I think uh, we would expect more people from wherever they are. I mean, after the COVID world, uh, to actually not specially centered around Bangalore to build their startup, and uh, it's probably even better not to come to a city like Bangalore. It's so crowded, and you may not be able to move things very fast. So, and climate tech doesn't necessarily need you to uh, come to Bangalore. While you know other tech companies, you know all the. Uh, IT coaching centers are all in Bangalore, so they used to come. But uh, as Sham said, we don't necessarily, IT is not the solution to climate. So you can be anywhere and solve uh, the problems on climate. So I believe that uh, it, it can yeah. be fairly anywhere. Sure, Ganesh. Uh, no, I think uh, thanks for the valuable comments and water for me is a very important uh, sector. So maybe Sham, uh, just kind of taking forward from Ganesh's comments that, that I think, uh, these startups are really addressing some of the core challenges, say around water security, waste management, uh, not much discussed is the decarbonization of the buildings, but still we see kind of challenges in kind of uh, investments kind of coming up broadly in the climate uh, sector. So what do you think are the key uh, barriers that be uh, investing in, in this space and what could be the possible solutions you think that can really unlock financing uh, that we need to kind of scale up the solution see the i mean as i was mentioning earlier this industry from a commercial return perspective has not delivered the irrs that the institutional limited partners or investors in funds have typically looked for so there is uh, generally an expectation of a 25 percent to 30 percent return that a fund has to do on a year-on-year -year basis. And there are many reasons for it. And it is not an easy problem to solve. I mean, uh, you know, and uh, the reasons, I mean, one set of reasons, there are a million reasons. One big set of reasons is in climate, your end users, you are not in a blue ocean space, you know, fundamentally like in internet businesses, et cetera, where you're creating some new businesses where nothing existed and you can get scale by leveraging the internet. Here, you're basically trying to provide solutions into industries where there are and where there are corporates who have been entrenched for decades and you have vendors entrenched for decades. And there is a huge, I won't like, it's not about a nexus. There is a huge existing relationship and a ecosystem that a startup has to break and get in. And so it doesn't matter how good your environmental credentials may be. End of the day, your decision at the other end is pretty much almost always going to be basis. Is this final solution cheaper than what I today have? So now you, all of those solutions have had decades for their cost down and that curve, they've ridden that cost curve down. And those solutions are at a point where they are stable. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is in any of those underlying industries. So if you are a new technology coming in and saying, I want to throw my hat into the ring and I have a lot of climate credentials, today nobody is yet willing to give you credit for saying that I'll get carbon credits or this or that for something because they are like, you know, maybe that will be there, maybe that won't be there. So you still have to offer your end solution, whatever disruptive tech you've got, at a price parity or even cheaper than what the existing guy is today offering. It, that is the, if you ask me, this has been the fundamental reason why uptake has been slow, that these are not blue ocean. These are red ocean spaces. There are a lot of existing players and vendors in this ecosystem and startups have to fight entrenched players to make their presence felt and get in. So if you got something really strong from a tech basis, because of which your costs for making that end product, whether it is hydrogen or industrial waste heat or whatever it is, is much cheaper, and you are able to offer that, then you have a good shot at getting in. And the green brownie points are the green brownie points you get. I mean, it's just brownie points. It's the fact that they can, the end user can claim credit for using something green. But in most cases, the the reason why you're choosing the technology eventually comes down to a pure economic rationale. Now, the issue with that is it's their new technologies. They have to ride a cost curve down. And if you don't give them the chance, which is the reason in the first wave, 
you know, when you had companies like Mia Solar, Nano Solar, etc., which were far more technically advanced than the solar panels we use today. They were generations ahead, but they never had the chance to write that cost curve down. Those technologies were at three, four, five dollars a unit, whereas the multi-crystalline silicon wafers, which came from China, was going for fifty cents a unit. How do you compete? You need that four, five years to write that cost curve from five dollars to fifty cents. And many of those tech companies never got that opportunity. So this is where, I mean, these are the, how do I call it? These are the institutional basic problems that you have in climate tech, which is the reason why the whole journey is technically much harder. Then you take some underlying areas, say, for example, the area Ganesh works in. Now, Ganesh solutions, if they are in a Singapore where they value water so much more, they are willing to pay so much more for water, any, almost any solution in water makes more sense in a country which is willing to pay more. I mean, I used to live there. Sometimes my water bill was way more than my electricity bill, you know, and that's the, I'm talking as a, just a regular user. It was just me and my wife in a house and our water bill was higher than the electricity bill. And in India, no one who looks at a water bill, right? Who even sees it? It's part of a regular maintenance contract in a, in a, uh, in a, in a flat. So you don't pay, right? I mean, most of these things are considered public good or in case of electricity, uh, you know, individuals, you know, we pay a subsidized rate. We are not paying the real cost. It's the industry that takes the cost for power. So, you know, you are talking about end products that are commodity, subsidized, practically expected to be public goods. And you are bringing in disruptive innovation into a space like that, where as it is, these things are not priced anywhere near what they ought to be priced. Forget the climate or carbon impact of any of these things. That is anyway not captured because there is no inherent carbon price there for any of these end things. So this is the mountain, the Mount Everest that these startups have to climb, which are typical internet native software startup trying to build a new solution in a world where you're not competing against anything else, you don't face any of that. You're in a blue ocean world there, you know, if you have a product that people want, people are paying for it and you scale on the back of the internet here. But unlike here, hardware, capex, end commodity markets, very low prices, no inherent carbon price built in. The mountain is so much higher for a climate startup to climb versus uh, a typical blue ocean internet startup. So this is the baseline. I mean, so everything, every, you can get into the weeds of each sector, but this is the underlying problem, which there is no easy solution for it. And the world is not going to agree tomorrow morning to a hundred dollar carbon price inherently for anything. If the world agreed to that, 90% of the, car, the solutions out there that climate guys are making today, startups are making today would be economical in an instant. If there was an inherent carbon price of say hundred dollars built in, but we we are not in such a world, okay. so you know, so you have that inherent barrier to overcome basically. So this is just a, a summary of what I feel is the basic problem. Sure, sure. So Vishal, uh, just to kind of uh, kind of kind of a follow up to that uh, point, and I see that industry an important role both in terms of its own decarbonization plus in end customer or, or an off taker for all you know, the products that the startup solutions are kind of uh, developing and so here the question is like what are then still the challenges new technologies at scale and how does industry kind of engage say with startups such as that of Ganesh's uh, to help to kind of deploy the solutions and to provide them the right enabling environment plus maybe the funding or that maybe the avenue to do some kind of pilots. Sure. Thanks, Ruvnail. So in terms of uh, corporates uh, looking right. at uh, financing or funding this uh, new technology, Asham alluded to that point where uh, currently the returns for uh, climate technologies are not commensurate to the conventional projects, right? Uh, but it, things are changing uh, uh, really fast in terms of the commitments which are put out. And uh, of course, uh, the underlining internal pr carbon price, maybe by government is not there, but corporates who have, let's say I'm talking more from, Indi again, Indian corporates, where corporates have committed for net zero, committed, corporates have also put out the price of carbon. So at least those set of companies have started internalizing the uh, price of carbon. And... Uh, 
most of these companies have not just committed for 2050, but they have also said that uh, they will reduce by 20 or 30 or at least half of their emissions by 2030. And unless these companies now uh, come out and bet on uh, maybe existing uh, set of solution providers or the startup ecosystem, they are not going to uh, meet the targets which are put out in public. Uh, so the uh, the internalizing the carbon price has started uh, to take place by a lot of companies and these are the set of companies who are also ready to take bets on maybe a technology which is not proven till date like uh, the good example here is Tata Steel has put out the carbon capture uh, pilot again to go up to the scale at which it is required, it will take some time, but they have gone ahead and invested in this technology and they have worked with a startup, uh, not a startup from India, but a UK based startup. But uh, I, again, in next one or two years, you will see maybe Indian startup doing those pilots for, uh, and again, this pilot, if you see the amount of investment is not that small, a five ton per day capacity of carbon capture would be a huge investment uh, from a company like Tata Steel. Similarly, other companies are also running their own uh, uh, st startup challenge or uh, accelerators where they're putting out problem statement uh, uh, to the outside world and saying that, okay, somebody who can come up uh, with a solution uh, for decarbonization, be it uh, decarbonizing the thermal energy or the electrical energy or some part of their value chain, uh, maybe moving to green logistics or net zero logistics solution. Their companies are uh, working with the startup ecosystem. And uh, uh, the right way, of course, from let's say somebody who is going and talking to large organizations would be to maybe uh, reach out uh, to the senior leadership. So if if you if you keep talking to the procurement colleagues, maybe they'll not comp they would not have the whole context of what the organization uh, wants to achieve in longer term. But maybe the chief procurement officer or uh, the in if it is a large manufacturing setup, uh, talk to the manufacturing officers of those companies. They know the real mandate, what they have, and uh, what kind of bets uh, what kind of appetite they have to make investments even where the returns are not there like the carbon capture there is absolutely no returns because you are just capturing carbon and maybe storing it or venting it out but uh, a company like Tata Steel did invest a huge amount uh, of money there so uh, and the other side in terms of uh, when companies look at startup what are the things they look at right so uh, two or three things which they look at when they want to start engaging with startup one is uh, when they try looking out they are not able to identify who is a real, right startup who can work and solve a particular problem for them. So maybe that problem needs to be addressed somehow. The second thing which companies always, uh, uh, when they engage with startup, they'll ask for a, a proven use case. So if if a startup, maybe even if it, uh, it it's an early stage, if it has a proven use case, then the ability for the company to back and invest uh, uh, that technology, uh, the the amount of chances or converting that will will be exponential. And third thing which large companies, of course, uh, also consider is the whole longevity of the startup. So whether a startup will uh, exist because the decarbonization commitments are 20, 30 year horizon. So whether the, the company on which a company like Tata Steel or a Mahindra or ABG will bet, whether those companies will exist in 20, 30 year time frame. So that is also back of the mind consideration by large organizations when they start talking to startups. So these are the three sets of issues uh, which needs to be dealt when a startup engages with the larger organizations. Sure, Vishal. So I think Ganesh, uh, Sham and Vishal can both kind of share their perspective on the challenges uh, and what you know, impedes uh, kind of scaling of the solutions. And as a kind of startup uh, entrepreneur, and maybe go, uh, maybe just taking uh, Plugsgen and Water as an example, like what has been uh, your experiences in terms of challenges in, in, in engaging with either corporates as end users or customers, or when you are uh, going to the venture community for kind of funding. So any kind of experience we wish to share in terms of challenges, plus 
uh, or the opportunities or maybe the solutions that you see uh, that can help address those challenges? So Suriel, I actually come from a family of teachers. I had no clue about how to do business. So I have all the examples how not to do business. So I ended up starting my work with working with people who would not be our customers. So I've just been knocking their doors. Uh, trying, I'll, I mean, of course, we also started trying to do water management for houses and put up this thing. But very soon, uh, fortunate to get... Uh, uh, an acceleration program. We were fortunate to get into Cisco Launchpad, and the the mentor there asked, "What are you doing? You are going all over the place." And that's when I uh, we did this uh, talking to the all spectrum of clients and figure out the beachhead, right? I think that is something that I advise all the startups not to be dumb entrepreneur like me. Talk to people and figure out where the uh, trail of money is, right? We always. You know, it's also an idealist, uh, many, some, many times an idealist taking up a climate tech is not a good thing. A person who has a capitalistic mind taking up is probably going to succeed more. I was more an idealist. So I think it is very important for an entrepreneur or anybody in this audience who wants to start in climate tech, uh, see where there is a financial uh, leverage, right? And also sustainability by itself is a uh, business imperative today in many cases may not be on, right? I mean, uh, for example, if they save water, if they're in Singapore and saving water, you know, there's a natural benefit. It's while you're solving a climate tech problem, you're also making the cost saving and there's a financial benefit out of it, right? So I think that is what I would say. We have to understand the trail of uh, where the uh, finances is. And then even when we talk about ESG uh, as a metric, how does it affect corporates? And of course, uh, uh, I would say, I mean, with my limited experience, large and very large care about it, like as Vishal said, right? They have commitments, they have. So it's a good thing that if large organizations are actually looking at it very seriously, I think startups should also be focusing how they can solve that, right? And eventually, if a large corporate solves a problem and they are adhering to the uh, business response sustainable reporting norms of the new SEBI thing, then they would expect, if they complete it, they would expect all their value chain to follow it eventually. Like for example, I know Goldridge want their vendors to have a green uh, way of doing things, right? So eventually they have an uh, upper hand. So, so the trail is start with a big organization like with the Tata Steel, Tata, Goldridge, or all this thing, understand their pledge, read their sustainability report, understand what are their commitments, what is their pr pr priority right now, and don't waste time knocking those who don't even have that as a priority. So we recently did an exercise that I can share to all, right? I mean, we uh, asked a bunch of some IIT Karakpur students to do a research of all the society reports of important uh, uh, listed companies and identify where, what are the pledges that they have done, what are the society uh, journey they have uh, put across ahead, right? So this can happen. And now we have identified who are our uh, potential clients and we'll go knocking their doors. Before we were just all over the place trying to who wants uh, this one we are going. So I think the same holds good for other sectors, circular economy or solar or uh, various things that you look into, right? Green hydrogen. So uh, know who have already made such declaration also. And once you prove a case, as Vishal said, right? I mean, you have to show a success case. You have to show how you solved a problem of a client. And then you take it on. To us, uh, the biggest client, I mean, the first client was Titan Jewelry Division. We solved the problem one for them. Now we have solved pretty much the same thing for 60 other and 100 plus locations. Had we not solved one client properly, we probably would have not gone anywhere. So that is some uh, little bit of my uh, ex uh, experience that I want to share with the entrepreneurs out there uh, to look at specific use case niche that they can crack and do it. Uh, fairly well. Uh, you can't do 100% anyway. Very good. I think fully agree. Uh, so I think we're uh, almost out of time, but we can take maybe a couple of questions. Uh, one question from Himangi. Uh, can you provide examples global or in India of CCS technologies that are currently being applied at a commercial scale for steel or cement? So Vishal, uh, uh, yeah. maybe I can request that to you. And then the second question at the interest of time, uh, uh, Please feel free to jump in anybody he is from ajit uh, solar renewables can be of two modes uh, pv and thermal so the question is like which is kind of more kind of sustainable and kind of cost efficient 
so these are two. So maybe like Vishal, you can take the first one, and then I can ask Sham or Ganesh. Yeah, one. yeah. Thank, thank you, Amangini, for the question. So, uh, in terms of commercial uh, deployment of carbon capture as a technology, uh, from an Indian context, I gave you Tata Steel has already done a pilot. There is another chemical company down south, Tutikoran uh, Chloralkali. They have also implemented a carbon capture and they have also con you converted that into uh, some form of chemical which is getting utilized again so those are two uh, examples which uh, where uh, a, a steel company has already implemented from an indian context i know that there are a lot of other cement companies in india who are working they are at the drawing drawing board of doing a pilot in carbon capture globally there are a lot of uh, ca carbon capture projects which have been implemented uh, by steel and cement sector both uh, staying with cement there are about eight projects which are operational uh, one of the largest which is a northern line projects uh, over here there there's a industrial cluster who is uh, where you have the oil com oil companies like shell who are coming along with a large Not cement company which is heidelberg cement and the government uh, who is uh, co-investing into that project that's that's a project which is up and running and uh, you also have a lot of uh, technology players. So you have uh, companies like Acre Solution. Here in India, LNT uh, has their own technology of carbon capture and utilization. So a lot of action uh, which is happening uh, here in India as well as globally. Sure, Vishal. And I can take the second question if you sure, sure, please. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Ganesh. Yeah. Yeah. See, I think uh, the unit economics matter, whichever uh, energy uh, generation that you can think of, and uh, uh, between the competition between solar photovoltaics and thermal solar photovoltaics was able to make faster scale for various reasons. Probably there's there's no moving parts in it, and it is easy to deploy, and uh, uh, scalability of uh, one piece to others and retrofitability, or rather putting it in a, uh, a array uh, and you can expand it at any level. All, some of these are the merits. Uh, solar thermal uh, is quite challenging, though, as you rightly put, it is uh, mostly more sustainable from you take the raw materials and uh, this one. But uh, I think uh, it, it it is each solar thermal plant is unique. It cannot be like, unlike solar photovoltaics, they're all same. I mean, each solar thermal plant, it also depends on the uh, thermal energy in that location. The variation of thermal energy is more uh, varying compared to photo, I mean, the light. I mean, the incoming solar radiation in Bangalore and Rajasthan, there might be a maximum 20% difference uh, in a given season, right? But uh, that's for the light. That's the so physics of it is light. But here, the thermal energy, the dynamics is really, uh, very different and adoptability in different geographies on same technology in that way again solar, solar photovoltaic uh, wins about thermal i think sham you've been in this more than me <laughs> you could... yeah so we looked at this space a lot in the past you know what we've realized is people have been trying to solve this multiple ways one is this whole centralized solar thermal where you go to like a desert and you have these massive vertical towers where you've got these hundreds of thousands of mirrors that are you know shooting or rather focusing the light onto these massive solar thermal vertical towers problem with that is yes you can get heat you can get uh, a thermal output but you will get the kind of temperatures you need because for many industrial processes you have different ranges of temperatures that you need now the real high end you will not you will only get that at a very very small dispersion of time in a day is when you will get the highest amount of heat at that location. Now, the problem is you still have to transport that heat from where you get it in whichever part of a desert or wherever to the industrial use case. So you lose a lot in the transfer. So these centralized solar thermal facilities, what we realized is you only get very high heat at a certain point of time. And then in transport, you lose a lot of it. Now, on the distributed solar thermal, which is on top of industrial rooftops, which is another approach even startups in India have tried in the last 10, 12 years. We've looked at a few companies while we were doing Infuse Ventures, our fund. We never invested in it and we tracked it because for whatever reason, we realized that 
those solutions, especially tried in Chennai and around Chennai for the auto industry, there were startups that were focused on keeping these solutions on the rooftop because you actually had both users. You had power and heat usage required under in the same facility. But it never could scale. And it had in every case, I mean, TV has used it, a bunch of people used it. It kind of made sense for a limited amount of duration and time. But you are really not augmenting. You are maybe able to replace 10 to 20% of your heat and power requirements. You are never able to go beyond that. For multiple reasons, these solutions could never scale. Maybe the temperatures that you hit were not good enough. For multiple reasons. So what we've realized is it is just too customized. It was not giving the amount of heat that was needed for the amount of additional work that you would do going beyond the pure PV part of it. So multiple... This, this space has struggled to scale globally and uh, it has become, it was very customized in its approach versus a product deployment at scale model, which you can do with PV from a pure power perspective. The moment heat comes in, it, it became too customized for it to scale. And hence that sector hasn't quite taken off. Not saying someone won't solve it at some point, but it just hasn't been solved in the last even globally nor in India over the last 10, 12 years. Now you don't have too many companies anymore in this space. There were quite a few at one point of time. I know that we have exceeded that time a bit. Uh, so I will like request Ashwati to kind of uh, wrap up, but I really kind of enjoy the conversation. So thanks, Sham, Vishal and Ganesh uh, for sharing your uh, available perspectives. And we hope to kind of reconnect again in the future. Uh, so what do you ask? Thank you. Thanks, Uranil. And thanks, everyone, for coming in today and sharing your thoughts and experience. Uh, I'm sure I speak for everyone here when I say this was a great session and very insightful. Uh, we've all learned something here. Uh, so thanks again. And uh, maybe very quickly for the audience here, we still do have a few events left, uh, which goes on until next week. For the startups in the room, there's a VC spotlight session tomorrow. So you could join us for that with lower carbon capital. And for everyone else, um, investors especially, the summit is still on and hope to see you on Friday for the pitch event. And um, we also have two small, uh, two quick research briefs that we worked with our technical experts in our network with that we published. Uh, so. The link to download that is also in the chat. Um, so yeah, for some weekend reading. And uh, again, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Catching up with you all. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye.